Hi, everybody, and welcome to the August EERI Younger Members Committee webinar titled Advances in Seismic Risk Assessment Using Simulated Earthquake Ground Motions. My name is Amanda Sullivan, and I'm a structural engineer at Bureau Happold in the New York City office, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Before we start, let's go over some technical details. You can listen to the webinar via your computer or via phone call. Details for both were sent out in the registration email. During the presentation, you can post your questions or comments in the questions panel. Please make sure, since we have three speakers, to list who the question is for, and we'll address these questions after all three presentations. Today's webinar will last an hour and is being recorded. The recording will be posted to the EERI YouTube channel in a few weeks' time. For those of you who may not be familiar, I want to say a few words about EERI. The Earthquake Engineering Research Institute is the leading nonprofit membership organization connecting those dedicated to reducing earthquake risk. EERI has been bringing people and other disciplines together since 1948. By joining EERI, you become a member of our global network of multidisciplinary professionals dedicated to reducing earthquake risk. I want to also say some things about the Younger Members Committee. Uh, this committee provides opportunities for early career professionals to advance their careers and become active in the Institute early on. The current co-chairs are Ezra Jampol, Maha Inoui, who is speaking today, and Ashley Morales-Cartagena. A little bit more about YMC. Uh, we develop a technical and social in meetings for younger members at the EERI annual meeting and throughout the year, such as webinars, the YMC blog. Uh, we have a series introducing younger members to leaders in the profession, and we also connect with other EERI committees. Please send us an email or go on our website and fill out the form if you're interested in joining. Today we'll be hearing from Nenad Bielic, Maha Inewi, and Nasim Arafi about their respective research in this area. So without further ado, the first speaker will be Nenad Bielic, who is a postdoctoral scholar at the Unit of Applied Mechanics at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. He received his PhD from Stanford, and his research focuses on dynamics of nonlinear systems and application of statistical machine learning tools. Next up will be one of our own YMC chairs, Maha Inewi. Maha is a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Nevada at Reno. She received her PhD from the U University of California at Davis, and her research focuses on assessing the performance of reinforced concrete structures subjected to extreme events, as well as characterizing the regional earthquake hazard and risks to the built environment. And as previously mentioned, she's serving currently as co-chair of the YMC. Our final speaker will be Nasser Marafi, who's a senior modeler at Risk Man Management Solutions in Newark, California. Nasser received his PhD at the University of Washington, where he studied the effects of large magnitude subduction earthquakes on structures located in deep sedimentary basins. Nasser has received the EERI FEMA NEHERP Graduate Fellowship, the EERI Graduate Student Paper Award, and the UW CEE Charles H. Norris Award. Without further ado, I'll pass this along to Nenad to start us off. Thank you, Amanda. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Nenad Bielic, and um, I'm happy to share with you today some of the work that I've uh, uh, done in collaboration with Professor Greg Dierlein and Professor Tang Lin, and kind of the overarching theme of the work would be utilizing simulated um, earthquake ground motions to investigate seismic performance um, uh, of building and kind of this developed over the years um, throughout and kind of stems from my uh, PhD research um, and kind of one of the main ideas that we had is whether we can learn something new from simulations uh, which is not available, say, from recorded ground motions, just to the fact that there's a limited data uh, on recorded ground motions. Um, and one of the key, um, um, oops, one of the key benefits uh, I'll try demonstrating in the next couple of slides. So what I'm showing in the plot on the left um, is the um, 
or the curves corresponding to conditional mean spectra, kind of description of hazard at different intensities, so moving from uh, lower intensities all the way to higher ones, say 1% in 200 years. Um, this for a site in California, and overlaid in gray are the spectra of ground motions of all recorded ground motion from the NGA West uh, to database. Um, and what you can notice here um, is that at these higher intensities, uh, there's a scarcity of data. So if you want to investigate, let's say, collapse risk uh, of buildings, you necessarily need to you know, scale these motions. And people have worked on methods how to do this. Uh, but, but one thing that you know, simulations kind of enable you to do is to do the same types of analysis, but without having to scale anything. For example, showed on the right-hand side, the same hazard targets, but overlaid with spectra from simulated as part of the SCEC CyberShake project, which I'll mention later on, um, at the Los Angeles downtown site. And you can see that the coverage uh, is much larger, especially uh, these higher intensities. And note, these are all unscaled um, ground motions. Since we'll, all three of us will be using um, ground motion simulations, I just thought it'd be good to give a brief kind of higher level overview of different approaches to ground motion simulations, just so you're kind of aware of what is available out there. So on one end of the spectrum are the so-called kind of stochastic models, um, which you know, described in a nutshell and very crudely, um, you take a white noise signal as an input, you pass it through a filter and out comes your simulated ground motion. Um, and now the properties of this filter you determine based or you calibrate based on recorded motions that you're using. So for the area for which you're interested in, ground motions and so forth. And you know, from what I just described, um, it is kind of clear that you know this approach is um, empirical and there's um, not so to speak, you know, underlying physics captured with this model. So in that sense, it's limited to um, uh, extrapolation in terms of the data on which you've done your training of your filter in this case. Um, on the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, on so-called quote-unquote physics-based ground motion simulations, which are essentially based on numerical simulations of waves propagating through 3D dimension, three-dimensional representations of Earth structure. Um, and in doing so, these approaches explicitly capture effects of you know, Earth structure, for instance, deep sedimentary basins and their effects on ground motion, which is a huge advantage of these, um, these approaches. One um, kind of quote-unquote limitation is of this approach is that there, these simulations are limited to lower frequencies, for instance, lower than one hertz, although you'll see this gets pushed up um, higher. And there's a number of reasons for this. Um, one aspect is just the computational demand, and other aspects are related to geophysical complexities in terms of resolving the parameters required for the models at the scale you need for these uh, higher frequencies. Uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, engineers, as we want to use these ground motions, we need broadband ground motion. So one way to address this limitation that has been proposed is to use these so-called hybrid broadband simulations, which very put in simple terms, they combine uh, a stochastic simulation at a high frequency with physics-based or numerical simulations at longer periods and kind of splice them together to create um, hybrid broadband uh, ground motion. And it's these types of ground motions that I have been using um, my area of application corresponds to the CyberShake domain, so it's Southern California. If you're not familiar with the region, um, this is roughly LA downtown, and somewhere around here is the Magic Kingdom. Um, now, the results that I'll show you in this presentation are based on 20-story uh, uh, buildings. So this is 20-story reinforced concrete moment frame um, uh, designed in previous studies by Hazleton and Airline. Um, and this is a ductile moment frame modeled in 2D in open seas uh, with nonlinearities captured with uh, blunt plastic hinges. And kind of the idea is we want to focus our attention mostly kind of on collapse uh, risk. Um, 
even though the overarching theme is, you know, just very broadly using simulations to learn about performance structures in maybe areas we don't have much empirical data for, there's a couple of um, parts to that. One relates to validation effort. In a sense, uh, you can say this, do we trust the simulations and to what extent? And then if yes, can we use them to learn something new about um, interesting uh, uh, phenomena such as collapse risk and the uh, basin. And finally, additional aspect that we'll talk about is application of some uh, big data and kind of machine learning tools to just leverage just the abundance of simulations that are available. In terms of validation, I'll just make a plug for a couple of papers on this. And on our part, we were interested in this for one to see if we can um, to what extent we can trust simulations to move into more interesting areas of application and also to provide potentially feedback to ground motion simulators. And, you know, uh, armed with this more confidence, we then moved into using um, simulations to explore um, collapse risk in the Los Angeles Basin. Um, and so before I get started, I mentioned the SCEC CyberShake project, where SCEC stands for Southern California Earthquake Center. And it's a project which uh, performs uh, probabilistic seismic hazard assessment uh, by fully using uh, physics-based or numerical ground motion simulations. Uh, so if you're familiar with the PSHA project, uh, you know, process, uh, you essentially replace the empirical GMP with CyberShake, and that's how you, you go about it. Uh, this is very high level overview. For more details, there's this excellent paper but for the purposes of this presentation, uh, the important part is that for every rupture from the earthquake rupture forecast, uh, let's say USERF 2 or 3, um, CyberShake generates an associated seismogram. So there's a full waveform that you can use to analyze your structure. So you just don't get just get intensity measures, you get the full waveform. Um, and this is a huge advantage because it lets you be, you know, more creative in how you do your analysis. So to see this, let's just take a step back and see how do we use earthquakes, you know, ground motions in uh, earthquake engineering. So a uh, conventional approach would be that you start uh, to develop hazard using recorded ground motions. You develop a target spectrum, the conditional spectrum, uh, or anything that you like. And then the next step would be you then select and scale ground motions, again, recorded ones to match that target, and then you run it through uh, your structure. So there's this two-step process which is connected in between or linked by the use of intensity measures. But if you're using CyberShake data, for instance, or that type of data, you can directly go you know, from your rupture to your structural performance without having to use any scaling of ground motions or any intensity measures for that matter. Um, what I just described in figures uh, is shown here in the equation. I will not go through the equations. I will just mention that if you want to do this direct analysis that I mentioned, um, you have the way you do it, for instance, we did it for four sites in the Los Angeles Basin for different reasons. Um, and the way to do it is you need to run your analysis, so run the ground motion through your structure for every ground motion simulated for that site, such so that all that collective set of grammars represents the hazard. In terms of CyberShake, this is about 400 to 500,000 ground motions per site. So for these four sites, these, this required about 1,900,000 nonlinear analysis of the 20-story building that I've shown, uh, which in se sequential computation would take you know, roughly 20 plus years. Um, so naturally, uh, we used high-performance computing, specifically mostly Sherlock computer cluster at Stanford, which then made it manageable so that we can do one site in a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, and what I'll show you next, I'll just get to, uh, you know, almost a punchline of contrasting this conventional approach with the direct analysis for the deep, deep basin site in the Los Angeles uh, basin. And again, just to repeat, the conventional analysis is based on um, using recorded ground motion scale to hazard targets that are determined using PSHA uh, based on empirical ground motion prediction equations, where the, the, this is contrasted to a direct analysis approach using CyberShake data. On the bottom left plot, I'm showing the hazard curves just for comparison. The black one 
would be the USGS one, the red one is the CyberShake one, so you can see there's differences. But a more striking difference is, as you can see on the right, uh, in this comparison of uh, conditional spectra, um, where the red line, which corresponds to CyberShake, has much larger intensities at longer periods. And this we've observed at a number of intensities, so naturally this propagates if you do risk fully into risk demand exceedance curves, as you can see them here, or for the purpose of this uh, presentation, in mean annual frequency of collapse, which is about eight times higher if you compute it using CyberShake approach compared to you know state-of-the-art empirically based uh, approaches. For more details, I'd refer you to uh, this paper here because uh, there's a lot of different things that you can do when you have just a lot of data so you can deaggregate collapse risk and so forth but one thing that you can say here well I was expecting this big of a difference given the difference in uh, conditional spectra that you see um, so what we kind of wanted to do next is to investigate the question whether um, if we look at the base and ground motions themselves, is there something about them that makes them more damaging as compared to, let's say, non-base and ground motions? Um, and to do this, um, we extracted a set of ground motions from this, again, deep basin site, STNI, and we match a set of ground motions from a site outside of the basin, this Pasadena site, and we select the sets such that they have matching spectra, which is shown on the left. So the blue is the basin, the red is the non-basin set. They have the matching spectra in terms of means and dispersions, but we also ensure the close match and significant durations. And so the question we're asking, if we have these two sets, one basin and one non-basin, that are you know, nominally identical in terms of you know, uh, recognize intensity measures, is there still something more damaging about the basin ground motions? Um, just before answering that, as uh, you know, just as a reference, this black line corresponds to the same scenarios as the one selected for the basin ground motion sets, but just recorded outside of the basin. So this is what people would typically do previously, you know, compare the ground motion recordings inside the basin and outside the basin. Notice the difference, amplification factors, and all of that. But we had a slightly different approach. Um, again, ensuring that they have same spectra and durations, but do they have different uh, collapse capacities? Shown here is the one example for one specific seismogram that was matched in this way. So the blue one is the basin ground motion, the red one is the non-basin ground motion, and you see the good match in spectra. And if you examine these numbers, close matches in duration, but when you run uh, Ida with these ground motions and kind of compute collapse capacity, the base and ground motion ends up being much more damaging, about 33%. And we see this effect in the entire um, set as well. Um, why this is happening? I mean, you could, you know, hand wavy say, well, this is record to record variability, but this didn't satisfy us. So we actually looked into what's driving these differences. For more info on that, look into this paper. But I'll just say that we also noticed this effect in recorded ground motion, so we're working on kind of examining that uh, in the future. And then lastly, um, the last part I'll just mention is, um, as I said, we have this data of one or two million nonlinear response history analysis. So of course, coming from Stanford, you have to use big data and machine learning, and this is what we've done with these kind of um, uh, data points to see is there something new that we can learn about efficiency of ground motion uh, intensity measures as well as develop tools that enable you to do regional risk estimates very efficiently and this is something that I'm actively working on um, and with this uh, you know I would just like to thank you for your attention this is just an overview of the work that we've done uh, and this work has been um, supported by many um, the institutions along the way, which I'm uh, very grateful for. Uh, but I just want to finish by saying that the more exciting and more interesting things are yet to come, and you will definitely see this in the next presentation when my colleague takes over. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Thank you, Ninad, for the presentation. Uh, my name is Maha Inewi, and I'm happy to be here today to talk about um, some of my research at the University of Nevada, Reno, on assessing the risk of um, to simulated to using similar earthquake ground motions to reinforce concrete structures. So first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the project that I'm a part of. Uh, my, the work that I'm doing is funded by the Department of Energy uh, under the Exascale Computing Project. It's a project that is led by Dr. David McKellen of the University of Nevada, Reno and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. It includes a large team of engineers, geophysicists and mathematicians and computer scientists. And the project objective is to enable a detailed understanding of the earthquake hazard and risk on a regional scale using high resolution physics-based ground motion simulations that are resolved to high frequencies of engineering interest and um, uh, up to five and 10 Hertz in run recent runs we've been doing. And I think um, the, the difference in, in this project is that we are using uh, high performance computing tools and we are using sophisticated numerical models so that we're using a fully deterministic approach over the entire range of frequencies uh, of the ground motions, which is slightly different than the approach uh, Nina just talked about. Um, first, I'd like to go back a little and talk about the motivation for using uh, simulated earthquake ground motions. Uh, generally, we use simulated earthquake ground motions when we don't have enough observations where we need them. In this particular case, we're interested in ground motions near active earthquake faults. And um, we, we don't have enough observations near active faults, and that leads to significant uncertainty in our predictive equations, in addition to limiting our ability to study the unique characteristics of these ground motions um, and the effects of site conditions and fault rupture characteristics on these ground motions in, in the near fault area. So um, the next question becomes, if we are gonna use these simulated ground motions, can we convince ourselves that they are realistic? And this is kind of um, the, the question that is always underlying the use of these simulated ground motions. And as a structural engineer, um, I've learned in that this, the knowledge in this field is advancing rapidly and it's always increasing. And um, so here I'm gonna show a sample of uh, it's kind of the confidence building checks that we do when using these simulated ground motions. Uh, we are uh, looking at here a maximum direction uh, orientation independent response spectra, a comparison between simulated and recorded data set within 10 kilometers of fault. So this is very close to the fault. And what we try to see in these comparisons is, are we capturing the statistical range of variability in these ground motions? And so um, our, our comparisons tell us that we're, we're, we're capturing that variability. If we look at the structural response, we also see that, if we look at the structural response, we also see that um, we are sampling enough within the statistical variability that we're able to uh, capture the um, structural response that we see to recorded ground motions. Although we have very few recordings here compared to uh, the simulated ground motions, and here we're looking at maximum interstory drift demand, we see that uh, the medium values are close and we're getting a good range of the variability. So then once we have uh, enough confidence in these ground motions, there are a lot of questions of engineering interest that we can explore. For instance, um, how does the structural risk vary spatially in a given earthquake scenario? And how do the site conditions and the fault rupture characteristics impact the structural risk? In addition, we can look in detail into what makes these near fault ground motions more damaging and how we can characterize it for um, engineering risk assessments. So over the next few slides, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the observations that we see 
uh, in response to these uh, questions that we try to explore. First, our target region for this project is the San Francisco Bay Area. Today, I'm going to be representing. I'm going to be uh, presenting simulations uh, from an oversimplified domain representing uh, strike slip ruptures of the Hayward Fault. This is run in gigantic, um, massively parallel simulations in Lawrence, Berk in Lawrence Livermore Lab uh, by Arvind Patarka and Artie Rogers. And uh, the, the domain that we're looking at at the surface is 100 kilometers by 40 kilometers, includes thousands of stations and uh, multiple components of the gram motions. And um, I take these gram motions and then I apply them to reinforced concrete moment frame structures to understand the structural risk. And this, this is also a highly parallel simulation that I conduct using the Quarry Machine Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in OpenSea's software. Um, so as an output from these simulations, we get uh, these type of what we call structural risk maps, where we can look at the change in the intensity in the ground, in the, in the structural risk. In this particular case, we're looking at interstory drift over the entire the domain due to a magnitude seven, for instance, earthquake. And these plots give us a lot of information uh, about looking at the um, where the, gram, the, the structural response is most intense. We're looking here at particularly the fault normal component of the ground motions. And they tell us a lot about the variability of the structural response at different distances from the fault. For instance, if we plot um, lines along the fault at 1, 10, and 15 kilometers away and create distributions of the structural demands, we see that there is a very large variability um, it, over at a particular distance from the fault, specifically for flexible structures. And um, to give you an, a sense of the magnitude, we see that the maximum structural demands can vary by a factor of up to eight, one kilometers away along the fault length. And so um, this can have obviously a lot of implications on our structural uh, response assessment and risk assessment studies. We also get an opportunity using these um, very highly dense simulations to explore the accumulation of the seismic waves as the rupture propagates. In this particular case, we're looking at a rupture propagating uh, from this blue star to the right of the domain. And this is better known as a forward rupture directivity effects and is known to lead to significant velocity pulses in the fault normal component of the ground motion. These velocity, we can see, we can study the characteristics of these velocity pulses in the ground motions and how they affect structural demands. Here I'm kind of showing um, kind of a representation of the deformed shape of the building, and we're seeing that um, the, the structural demands kind of increase with the, the increase in the amplitude of the ground velocity. I'm also showing uh, uh, these kind of measures of plasticity in the structure. These are plastic hinges at the ends of the member that also represent the increase in their plasticity demand. So um, to, there's another way to look at that is if you kind of take a perpendicular line to the fault behind the rupture, you see that the structural demands are typically very low despite being close to the rupture initiation. And then as you move in the forward direction of the rupture, you start to see a large increase in the structural demands. Uh, and this increase, uh, we see that the, the maximum structural demands for this type of rupture are typically between uh, 15 or 20 to 60 kilometers away from the rupture initiation, beyond which uh, the, the demand starts to, to drop. This also tells us that if we're looking at the fault normal component, the most of the strong directivity effects for, for this magnitude and type of rupture are seen only within 10 kilometers of the fault. And then beyond that, um, you, the demands start to drop significantly. And one important question uh, that comes from this the same topic is, what is the potential range of differences between the fault normal and fault par parallel component? And this is important because it dictates what type of ground motions we can select for a particular analysis and scale depending on the site location from uh, the the rupture. So for instance, we know that the fault normal and fault parallel component, there are two perpendicular components, very close to the fault, uh, you see that there's a huge difference. The fault normal includes very strong velocity pulses 
compared to the fault parallel component. Whereas as you move further away, um, the two components start to look similar. And in certain cases, we even start to see uh, pulses in the fault parallel component, depending on the rupture characteristics. And so again, this tells us uh, this tells a lot of information about the type of ground motions that we need to pick and scale for engineering analysis. Another source of variability uh, within a particular earthquake scenario depends on the site conditions. In this particular case, um, we have a basin side and rock side in the domain, almost separated by the fault. And we're looking at a shallow basin, which is different from what Nina talked about, which was a deep basin. Uh, but having a uniform distribution of the stations and high density allow us to study the characteristics of the ground motions uh, on either side of the fault and in, in the basin, on the basin and rock side, very close to the fault. And that tells us that the ground motions on the basin side within 10 kilometers are consistently higher than those on the rock side. And you see that the difference becomes more significant at longer periods. Of course, that manifests in the structural response as well. So if you try to um, plot, again, a variability at one kilometers away from the fault on either side, the basin and the rock side and the structural demands, you see that the structural demands on the basin side are consistently higher than those on the rock side. And typically the amplification we've seen is higher for flexible structures. Now, as you move away from the fault, we also see that not only the ground motions are amplified, but we see an increased shaking duration. And um, these, this increase is um, typically not as, as much as you would see in a deep basin, but it, it, it's significant enough that it would affect the structural demands. So if you look at a, two stations eight kilometers away from the fault, you see that the station on the basin side has about uh, three times the significant shaking duration as the station on the rock side. This has manifested in increased uh, drift demands, but also, more importantly, in increased rotation demands because this type of reinforced concrete structure um, experiences a degradation. This can lead to um, a, a very reduced, much reduced collapse capacity at the, on the basin side as compared to the rock side. Now, another characteristic we look at, the previous slides talked about differences um, of variability within the same scenario. Now we, we don't we don't know exactly how the fault will rupture, and so the different rupture details can have a significant impact on the ground motion intensity and the structural demands. And uh, to to kind of look at that, we have two types of slip distributions along the fault that we look at. We look at a stochastic slip where the distribution by default is of the slip along the fault is stochastic. And the different type of slip where we look at a hybrid slip, meaning that we add these areas of concentrated high slip patches to the fault, which can happen anywhere. We know that for this type and magnitude of rupture, we usually have one or two slip patches, um, but we don't know what they would look like. This is sometimes referred to also as temporal variability because this is going to have in different earthquake scenarios. And um, our analysis tells us that it, the presence of these slip patches impacts the structural demands significantly. So uh, we're seeing here that the ground motion intensity is much higher at the same station near the fault between a stochastic and a hybrid slip scenario. And um, we see an increase of almost two, two and a half. Uh, we also see much uh, higher structural drift and plasticity demands in the structure when we compare these two identical stations that are one kilometers away from the fault. So um, this kind of opens up a, a question for the use of simulated ground motions in general. If we know that their different rupture characteristics will lead to different uh, structural demands, how many simulated earthquake scenarios do we need for an engineering risk assessment? And this is kind of an ex extensive question that we need a lot of simulations to answer. And um, you need to consider different um, rupture distribution of rupture asperities, different locations of the rupture initiation, and um, other parameters as well. However, uh, in terms of looking at the distribution of slip, we looked at a few scenarios and plotted the distributions again um, at one kilometers away from the fault. And our simulations tell us that 
the hybrid slip scenarios consistently have higher median demands and variability very close to the fault. And um, we also, we, the simulations also tell us that we can place these uh, areas of high slip in regions over, over the domain or over the fault plane so that they lead to more conservative estimates. So kind of the preliminary answer is we probably don't need a whole lot of simulations. We probably just need to determine um, where the, the the locations of the of the rupture asperities that lead to more to more conservative estimates of the structural demands. In this case, we know that when we place them closer to the fault, to, to the rupture initiation, then uh, we see higher structural demands and in certain cases higher variability. However, this is a question um, that we, we're still exploring. It needs a lot of analysis. So in summary, um, much of the uncertainty in designing structures to resist earthquakes comes from our limited knowledge of earthquake loading. And so physics-based ground motion simulations, they give us an opportunity to understand the variability in the earthquake hazard and NISC, particularly near active earthquake faults where we don't have enough observations. Um, these simulations can offer insight on understanding the impact of fault rupture characteristics and side effects, and also characterizing the characteristics, the properties of near fault ground motions, so that we're able to incorporate these properties into engineering risk assessments. And finally, um, the goal of using these types of simulation is eventually we can improve the ground motion prediction equations and um, our structural design guidelines for near fault analysis, particularly selection or scaling of, of recorded ground motions. Um, thank you, everyone. I will hand it over now to my colleague, Nasser Murafi, who will talk to you about um, his work on simulations of the magnitude nine Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. Thank you, Maha. <clears throat> Hi, so my name is Nasser Marafi. Um, today I'll be talking about the effects of simulated magnitude nine earthquake motions on reinforced concrete coral wall structures in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so this work was actually done while um, I was a postdoc and PhD student at the University of Washington. Um, and so I'll start off by just providing the audience of, uh, you know, uh, some of the motivation behind this work. Um, so the seismic hazard in the Puget Sound region um, includes large magnitude earthquakes due to the Cascade of Subduction Zone. Uh, earthquakes along the third fault rupture have about a 500 year return period. And the USGS estimates that there's about a 10% chance of this occurring in the next 50 years. Um, motions are expected to be long during this type of earthquake yet current design codes do not explicitly consider the effects of duration on structures in addition uh, a lot of the structures in the puget sound region are overlying a deep sedimentary basin that is known to amplify ground shaking intensity and this effect is also not considered in the seismic hazard calculations considered in the code we also don't have recordings for this type of earthquake and so our understanding of how buildings are going to behave during this earthquake are poor. So I'll start off by top speaking about how we plan on addressing the paucity of M9 recordings in the Pacific Northwest with the use of physics-based simulations. I'll then move on to talk about the characteristics of the ground motions produced during these simulations. And then the last half of the presentation, I'll talk about the impacts and what, this, what these simulations mean on the performance of mid-rise and tall reinforced concrete wall structures. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that this work was part of a, a large collaborative research project at the University of Washington and the United States Geological Survey. Uh, this work was not would have not been possible without the help of my co-authors, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Berman, Dr. Mark Eberhard, and Andrew McDesey. Uh, I'd like to also acknowledge the financial resources that were provided by the National Science Foundation, USGS, ERI, and ATC. And I'd like to uh, thank DesignSafe for their uh, generous computational resources and the scientific input um, 
from uh, numerous uh, researchers on the MNAM project. So the physics-based simulations were headed by Art Frankel and Aaron Wirth from the USGS, where they simulated uh, 30 realizations of a magnitude 9 earthquake. Each realization had varying rupture parameters, such as the location of the hypocenter, um, the rupture depth, the slip distribution, among many other parameters. And each scenario used a seismic wave velocity model of the Cascada subduction zone, which includes um, several deep sedimentary basins in the region. Um, high performance computers were then used to generate deterministic motions with period contents above one second. Uh, these deterministic motions were then combined with stochastically generated motions for with frequency constants below one second to create broadbands across a one by one kilometer grid uh, in the Pacific Northwest. So here are two scenarios of a magnitude 9 earthquake um, with a hypocenter just off the coast of Washington. Realization one um, on the left is a hypocenter rupturing towards Seattle and realization two had a hypocenter just off the coast of Washington, but rupturing away from Seattle. And what you start to notice is that the two realizations are actually of a mag magnitude nine earthquake, yet they produce different ground shaking time histories. The one in Seattle appears to be uh, much more intense. So here you can see this again, uh, using the velocity time history for Seattle for the two realizations. And if you look, you start to see that um, the amplitude between the two scenarios are different, where the rupture towards Seattle has a larger amplitude than the realization away from Seattle. If you look at the wiggles and the spacing of the, uh, the wiggles, you'll start to see that there's also differences in frequency content. Now, structural engineers have found ways to quantify both amplitude and frequency content using a response vector, which we can then use to estimate the engineering demand on structures. So here I'm plotting the response spectra for the two scenarios on the y-axis and on the x-axis, the period of the oscillator. And um, the spectral accelerations that you see between the two scenarios are quite different. For example, if you had a 20-story structure with about a, a period of about two seconds, and let's assume that it has a strength of about 50% of its mass, um, then, then what that means is that in in the realization where you have rupture towards Seattle, that structure would deform inelastically and um, start to see some damage. Whereas um, if you had the realization where the rupture was away from Seattle, that structure would deform elastically and return to its original state after the earthquake is over. Um, we wanted to quantify the effects of a magnitude nine earthquake probabilistically. So we actually simulated 30 realizations and um, here you can see the response spectra for all, all 30. And what you can see is that there's actually quite a, a large variation in spectral accelerations between the realizations. And this goes back to the variations in rupture parameters that Maha was presenting. Um, shown in red here is the maximum considered earthquake, which um, structural engineers would use to design structures. And um, what you start to see is that there's a lot of realizations that exceed the maximum considered earthquake used in Seattle. For example, at two seconds, we have about 20 out of the 30 realizations that exceed the MCE spectral ordinate. One reason for this is we think that um, because basin effects aren't considered in the seismic hazard calculations, the, the spectral accelerations that we're seeing from the simulations um, exceed that that we're using in design. Another um, interesting characteristic that we found is that there's quite some regional variation in the motions. And so these time histories are for Seattle. If I go 80 kilometers south of Seattle while maintaining a similar distance to the fault rupture plane, um, we saw that the shaking intensity um, was quite lower. Now, if you were to talk to any seismologist or ground motion modeler, they would say that they would expect similar shaking intensities between the two locations if they had similar site properties. And we weren't seeing that. Um, we can see the same thing again if we plotted the response spectra, where the spectral accelerations in Lagrange, Washington was, were actually much lower than that of Seattle. Now, we believe the differences that we're seeing here is, is due to basins. And one way to measure whether or not you are in a basin is to uh, measure the Z2.5 parameter. And, and this parameter is just a uh, uh, a, a quantitative measure that takes the measure the the depth from the surface 
uh, of the site, from the surface of the site to a depth uh, to where the crystalline, crystalline rock um, has a shear wave velocity of about 2.5 kilometers per second. So if you're in the deep part of the basin, you'd expect this distance or this Z2.5 parameter to be large. If you're in sort of the outskirts of the basin or, to, or outside of the basin, you'd see that this Z2.5 parameter was quite small. And so here I'm plotting a, the Z2.5 as a contour map. And what you start to see is the shape and size of the basin. And Seattle happens to be in areas where Z2.5 is actually quite large, where it's around seven kilometers. Whereas Lagrand, um, while it has a similar source to site distance, it, it, it's actually, it has a much, much lower Z2.5 value of about um, close to, actually outside of one, so close to zero. <clears throat> Another important ground motion characteristic is the frequency content at longer periods. Um, this is important because under strong shaking, our building is going to is going to deform and and elastically, and that causes the structure the the period of the structure to yield and um, its period to elongate. And so, what happens? The frequency content at longer periods than the elastic period starts to affect the response. And so, if we go back to the response spectra. Um, we can start to see that there are variations in the spectral shape between the realizations. For example, if we had a, a 0.5 second structure and this both and this structure yielded in both of these uh, realizations, um, when the in realization where the rupture is towards Seattle, uh, we would expect the building to see a much different response, a much more damaging response than in, in the realization where the rupture is away from Seattle. We also saw that the simulated motions have long durations, which is what you would expect from a large magnitude earthquake. And if we, when we compared this with uh, motions uh, measured during crustal earthquakes, we noticed that they're actually much long, lar longer. And so, um, and, and, and many researchers have found that long duration earthquakes cause the structure to go through more cycles and start to accumulate more damage. And so thus far I've showed that the, M9 simulations that we've had uh, produced high spectral chlorations. They, in some instances, they've produced damaging spectral shapes, and they're much and they have much longer durations. So the next question that we want we, that I wanted to look at is, you know, what this means for structural response. And so to answer this question, we wanted to analyze a set of structures that were representative of those designed and built in Seattle today. Therefore, we worked with the city and many of the engineering firms to develop um, structural archetypes that we can study. So to understand the effect of the simulations, we looked at a range of buildings um, with varying number of stories from four to 40. Um, these buildings were sort of representative of high rise residential condo buildings with fixed story heights of about 10 feet and a fixed floor to floor plate. The buildings had a lateral force resisting system of a central core um, that was coupled in one direction and uncoupled in the other direction. Um, the buildings also had up to four levels of basement levels. <clears throat> For all the archetypes we designed, we've built numerical models using open seas um, so that we can simulate the response of the building under strong shaking. So for each of the um, archetypes that we had, we subjected them to the M9 gram motions. And then for each analysis, we measured engineering demand parameters like maximum story drifts and the rotations. Um, and using that, we tried to predict the amount of damage that the build, each archetype would see in that realization. And then finally, using the results from these analyses, we would predict the likelihood of building collapse. Here's an example of two buildings subjected to the two M9 motions that I showed previously for Seattle. Um, the left animation is the rupture towards Seattle. The right animation is the rupture away from Seattle. And the contours that you see here represent the strain that the concrete and steel go through under the earthquake. The darker regions that you see right here just indicate areas where the concrete core has yielded. And the colored circles that you see here just indicate the likelihood of the gravity system connections failing. And what we start to notice between the two realizations is that the damage varies between realizations, even though both are of a magnitude nine earthquake. Before uh, we looked at the, M9, the results from the M9 simulations, we wanted to compare the performance of these archetypes 
with gram motions that represent the hazard computed from empirical relationships, like gram motion models, and then compare the performance of the simulations to that from recorded motions. Um, so to do this, we selected and scaled numerous gram motions to represent the seismic hazard in Seattle using a multiple stripe analysis. We then subjected all the archetypes to these motions and computed a collapse fragility function that I'm showing here on the left. We took this collapse fragility function, integrated it with the hazard curve to compute at the annual rate of collapse, which then we translated to a 50-year collapse risk. And so what I'm showing here is the 50-year collapse risk for all these archetypes. Um, I'd like to preface first by saying that the building code does target a 1% chance of collapse um, in 50 years. And so what we noticed is that if you used a motions that were selected to match a seismic hazard that did not consider the effects of basins, you were generally below that 1% chance of collapse. The minute you started to select motions using a seismic hazard that included the effects of basins using the gram motion basin terms available, um, that collapse risk increased to about 1.9%. So about double, just under double the target. Now, all of these uh, motions don't use any of the physics-based simulations. So next, we wanted to figure out a way of trying to use the physics-based simulations by first computing the collapse risk using gram motion selected to represent all hazards that were not large magnitude earthquakes. And then we computed the um, annual rate of collapse, so the collapse risk from just large interface earthquakes. So all the, all the physics-based simulations, so essentially we just replaced all the gram motions that were associated with large magnitude earthquakes with gram motions that were simulated. And then we computed the collapse risk for the two and combined it to compute the 50-year collapse risk. And what I'm showing here is the collapse risk um, considering simulated M9 motions and basin effects. And what we start to notice is that the collapse risk increases to about 2.6%. So um, this increase that you're seeing in collapse risk is really attributed to characteristics of the gram motions that I previously presented in the first half of the presentation. Now, these characteristics are not necessarily reflected in the gram motions that I've chose and scaled and selected to represent the seismic hazard here and here. And so to conclude, I've shown today that the Simulated magnitude nine cascaded subduction zone motions are damaging because they have large accelerations, they have damaging spectral shapes, and they are, are long in duration. The building code targets a 1% chance of collapse in 50 years. If you used a seismic hazard that did not account for basin effects, you generally met that criteria. The minute that you included basin effects, that the collapse risk almost doubled. And if you included the physics-based simulations and the seismic hazard calculations, that collapse risks went to about 2.6%. And so uh, next, I'd like to thank everyone for listening today. And I, we welcome any questions um, that our audience has on all three presentations. Thank you, Nasser. I think we can move on to the Q&A portion now. Um, for those who didn't weren't logged on at the beginning, uh, please just submit your questions here. Um, we have some to start. Um, we'll start at the beginning. I have a question for Nenad from the listeners. Can you please speak to the limitations of the hybrid broadband ground motion simulation approach in terms of its effect on the structural response? Yeah, um, thank you. That's a great question. So it, uh, essentially, what is the um, kind of the range of structures that you would want to um, examine either, you could kind of quote unquote reliably examine either by just physics-based ground motions or hyper-broadband um, simulations. And we did do um, some work along those lines. Um, um, it, I mean, the answer is pretty, uh, what we kind of found is what we were expecting to begin with. Uh, when you're using these hybrid broadband simulations, um, there's this splicing period, which um, 
is the period or frequency of which you're combining, you know, uh, below that period is the stochastic portion, above that period is the kind of numerical physics based um, component. Um, and let's say, you know, then it depends on, you know, the fundamental period of your building, whether it's above the splicing period or below the splicing period, uh, and also whether, you know, your the EDP, the engineering demand parameter that you're looking at, um, is susceptible made to higher modes, and whether your structure has, you know, all the, let's say you're building the first three modes, let's say control the most of your response, both in terms of, say, drift, but also accelerations, if all three are in the physics-based, um, domain, so to speak, then if you take the hybrid or the just the physics based version of that, so without the stochastic component, um, you don't uh, necessarily see the difference between them. Uh, but as long as soon as you start moving in this region, that you know, some of the modes are in the stochastic part, some are in the uh, deterministic part, then you can see uh, pretty large uh, differences in. Um, mostly these effect that are the demands that are controlled by higher modes. Uh, but uh, this is one of the reason, and you know, this is a contentious issue, so I don't have a definitive answer, but it, it is one of the points why we steered clear away. We wanted to have our structure with um, the fundamental more mode um, far enough, so to speak, from this placing period such that we're kind of not being affected by those uh, effects, so to speak. Um, yeah, but I hope, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, next, I have a question for Maha. Could you please give a hint at the impact of your near fault work might have on design codes? Uh, might you have a specific proposal based on your work? Yes. Um, so there actually, as I mentioned, there were a lot of questions that um, we're looking into. Most, most importantly, we're interested in uh, looking at the variability very close to the fault. And we, one of the things that I'm interested in doing is comparing how this variability compares to what you would get, the variability you would get if you follow the probabilistic seismic hazard conventional approach, or even you know, um, a, a more closer to the code approach. And this can give us an idea of whether we're, we're close to what we would see um, in in the in, in a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, or if we're missing some components of the variability. And I think, yeah, I think this is this could really be an important um, an important part of the equation because if we're looking at collapse capacity, we're always looking at distributions of structural demands. And we want to know both the median uh, capacity and the variability. And so this variability factors really heavily uh, in our uh, assessment of our structural uh, capacities. So knowing the variability, I think, and comparing what we see using the simulations as we get more and more confident in the simulations and comparing that to what we see from probabilistic seismic hazard analysis will give us an idea um, in, of where we are and will help us improve our um, our design uh, characteristics. Another area actually we're looking into as well is, which is we don't have a lot of near fault recording. So we're not confident in the characteristics of the pulse ground motions that we see. These are ground motions with strong velocity pulses. And um, we, we don't know, but, but we, there's been a lot of work on this over the past few years, but we st there's still some work to be done understanding how they affect the structural response in the near field, and you know what what types of structures are most sensitive to to these uh, ground motions, and how the change in their frequency content affects uh, the uh, the the structural response in the near fault, and this will also have an impact, I think, on the design because it would guide us to select particular um, particular ground motions for engineering analysis rather than others, because you want to make sure you're, you're, you're picking, you're selecting for your analysis ground motions with the right frequency content that will give you reasonable structural response um, distributions and demands that you're expecting to see at your site. Uh, 
Thank you, Maha. Um, moving on, I now have a two-part question for Nasser. So part one is, could you please comment on the basin edge effects and its impact on the structural response? And part two is, if the Seattle Basin was much shallower than Z1, how would the simulation validation process change? So, um, so the, the the response spectra in Seattle that that I've showed does include basin edge effects, but it also includes um, sort of amplifications that you get uh, due to the like the lens-like shape of the basin and the the contrast of um, shear wave velocity structure between rock outside of the basin or just below the basin and rock inside of the basin. And so it's all lumped in there. Um, Seattle is sort of in the middle of the basin, so you see so you see um, amplifications from all of the three effects, which include basin edge effects. Um, can you repeat the second question? Sure. If the Seattle basin was much shallower than Z1, how would the simulation validation process change? Z so Z Z1 and Z2.5 are proxies for basin effects and uh, or proxies for basins. And so in Seattle, um, we we typically like to characterize our basin using Z2.5 just because um, uh, just uh, I'll give you a, a brief history about the, the the history behind the Puget Lowland basins. Um, uh, there was you know thousands of th thousands of years ago there was um, the ice age that sort of compacted a lot of the um, till that that you see in Seattle. And so if you dig a couple of meters just below um, soil, you'll you'll start you'll hit this really hard till that tends to have shear wave velocities of about 500 to maybe a thousand meters per second and so our z 1.0 values in seattle are actually quite low compared to other regions but our z 2.5 values so the depth to rock uh, associated with uh, 2.5 meters per second are actually quite large and we believe that a lot of the basin amplifications that we're seeing is due to that um, stiffer rock being so far below um, the city All right, thank you, Nasser. I think we're running close on our time, so I think we'll move ahead to wrap up, but uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or any of the speakers with um, follow-up questions. We hope you enjoyed this webinar, and before we end, we wanna share with an upcoming webinar with you. So the EERI Professional Development Committee will be hosting a webinar titled A Multidisciplinary Approach to Improving Community Resilience to Natural Hazards on August 26th. If you're interested in attending this webinar, registration information will be included, included in the follow-up email you'll receive shortly. Um, thank you all for attending this webinar. Um, PDH information will be provided in a follow-up email. Please also complete the webinar survey to provide your feedback. If you're not already an EERI member, please see the follow-up email for more information about how to join, and the same goes for also joining the Younger Members Committee. To find out about upcoming EERI webinars, please check the EERI Pulse newsletter. And finally, we thank FEMA for supporting this webinar, and thank you to the three speakers today. Thank you. And thank you for your time.